Hey, what's up guys, Wes here. So in this video, I wanna break down one of my favorite techniques that I have taken from traditional art and brought over to the digital realm in order to like balance my color harmony a little bit better. It's something the old masters used to do, you know, since the invention of paint, basically. And <laughs> it's something that I've had a lot of luck with. I'm really starting to like it more and more uh, the more I'm using it, the more I'm trying to like integrate it in different ways. So I want to show you what the technique is, explain why the methodology behind it works, and then show a few ways that you can do it no matter what digital art program you use. So without further ado, let's get to it. All right, so what is this magical technique that, that all the old school pros used and you know, Renaissance and Baroque era and all this stuff that you can also use contemporarily now in your digital painting. And um, it's something pretty easy. It's actually very easy. We're going to bring it down into very simple terms. But this is an idea of an underpainting, a painting which is going to set you up for success um, in a variety of ways, which we'll touch on. But whenever you start getting into kind of the weeds and the muck of making and finalizing your painting. So what is an underpainting? So there's some traditional terms and really the ones we're going to talk about uh, is going to be toning and grisaille. And really what the difference between those is toning, whenever I think of toning, is just putting a wash on your canvas of a specific color. So let's say you have raw umber or you have, you know, a ultramarine blue or something. And basically you just really liquefy that down, you thin it out, and then you just put like a wash over it. You're toning your canvas. And what that does is it gets it away from all white. It's going to be easier to actually judge your real values. Okay. So usually whenever I tone a canvas, I use 50% gray. It's a perfect middle ground. I can go higher for highlights, um, like higher key for highlights, and then go lower and darker for my shadows or foreground or whatever. Uh, you can use any color, but something that's right around 50% gray is going to be, as far as value is concerned, could be pretty good. It's going to be pretty good. You want to have it to where... It's comfortable to look at. It's nice to look at. It's not super saturated because you don't want the colors to really conflict with that. Um, but that that's one thing. And that's basically a great way even to get rid of the blank canvas syndrome. You can do a wash on your canvas or even on digital canvas before you even start your sketching if you wanted to. Just to get, get rid of the white. Get rid of the new document white. Get rid of the gesso uh, you know, white or whatever. Just, you know, have something that is actually a neutral value that you can then use um, to, to judge your values against whenever you start adding them. You're going to get a more accurate painting that way. But the real one, the one I, I'm really digging right now and what I really want to kind of show off and explain a little bit to maybe give you an aha moment, because it definitely gave me one, is this idea of grisaille. So grisaille is an old term used to talk about a monotone or monochrome, uh, meaning one color, one chroma, underpainting, which is everything. It's your forms, it's your values, you render out, but you're only using one color. So whenever you hear grisaille, normally they mean gray, black and white, and then various parts of gray in between there. But it doesn't have to be completely gray all the time. You can use a warm color or a cool color. So you can use, I'll, I'll just say titanium white and ivory black make a fantastic gray that's very cool. So it's almost like a slate blue look. It's really nice. That's why Ander Zorn used it a lot. But then also you can use some warm stuff. I'm a big burnt sienna guy. I love burnt sienna. It's a nice yellowy orange color. Um, and I'm actually going to have some, uh, you know, hex codes or stuff like that up. That way, even if you're using digital, you can kind of get the same color and the same uh, vibrancy. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to use. 
Why would you want to do this? So there's a number of reasons why I enjoy the underpainting of doing a grisaille, doing a just monochromatic full render out. It doesn't have to be all the way done and finished, but you want to get your ideas of where's the light hitting, where are your shadows, block that stuff in. And you're since you're just using one color and then lightening and darkening it, you're not worried about bounce light colors and all that stuff yet. You'll get there but don't worry about it yet. This is just to get the information down on the canvas to help you paint later. So it does a number of things. It gives you a map that you can use later in the painting. And then also it's a great way to already get contrast from what colors you're going to use on the canvas. So this is the one that was kind of the mind blower to me. It's a really fundamental idea. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. And um, here in just a bit, we're going to hop over to some digital art programs and kind of show you some examples, some real time examples of using this technique. That way you can kind of see the differences of the, the qualities that you can get. There's a ton of ways to do this. But um, there's a few that I found that give me pretty consistent results that I'm pretty proud of and happy with. So mainly the contrast that you're looking for is warm versus cool. OK, this automatically makes your paint a little more alive. So the same thing happens in traditional. Um, whenever you have these nice kind of transparent glazed colors, warm on top of cool and stuff like that you get these really beautiful, rich looks that you can't really get anywhere else. I mean, some of my favorite stuff is like Frank Frazetta, John Singer Sargent. Um, they, they were kind of masters at that tug and, you know, push and pull of cool versus warm. And I just, I love it. I love the way it looks. And what I figured out is whenever you're working, whether traditional or digital, if you make your, your grisaille underpainting, the opposite temperature of what your primary painting is going to be, you're going to get that look. So if you're making a bright blue sky painting, it has some nice puffy clouds, all this other stuff that seems very cool nature. You have your blues, you have your slate grays, you have your white kind of silver, very cold, very cool blue shifted uh, hues. Make your underpainting, your tonal underpainting warm. Use a bright orange, use a burnt sienna, use that nice kind of deeper red whenever you make that underpainting and you put your values in, because then you're going to get some incredible looking contrast. And what's great, you don't even have to fully cover that painting area to get those nice hits of contrast which is really fun. I, I have so much fun just kind of playing with that idea, but really the, the primary rule is if you're primarily your painting is going to be warm. It's going to be a lot of reds and yellows and oranges, and you've already planned it this way. Make your underpainting cool. Use your slate gray, use your blues, a little bit of green, something like that. Make that underpainting nice and cool. So those reds and those warms have something to pop off of. But on the other hand, if it's going to be kind of an outside or like the snowy mountains, I've loved painting snowy mountains for a long time. If you want to do that, be sure that your underpainting is warm because all of the whites and the blues that you add on top of those are going to blend in real nice, give you some nice contrast. So just overall, I mean, this is a huge topic. This talks about chroma and color theory and vibrancy and hue and saturation value, all that stuff. And I do have some courses available. I have a gradient map course, which is one of the techniques that we're going to look at. But also I have a simplifying color theory course, which really kind of compresses this stuff down to super easy, digestible, repeatable steps. Uh, you're going to look at the color wheel completely different um, and way easier. It's way easier to read a color wheel after you really simplify it down. So just a shout out for those links in the description below, but let's get over to a few digital painting programs and kind of show you what I mean with this and a few methods to get a nice grisaille underpainting with only a few clicks of a button. So let's hop to it. All right, guys. So here we are. I have three programs open right now, and it'll make sense why here in a second. I basically just want to show you that no matter what digital 
art program you're using, there are a variety of ways you can get this same effect. And depending on the complexity and the amount of control you want to have on your underpainting colors, um, you have different options. So basically we have Clip Studio open here, we have Rebel open, and then I have Photoshop open. Photoshop's gonna be the one where I kinda do the more technical side of it, but you're gonna see all of these are very, very similar, and there's none of these that are difficult. Really, the first one's like two button clicks. Um, <laughs> but just to kinda give you an idea of how much control and variance you can have on this. So we're gonna go to Clip Studio first, and let's say uh, you have your black and white painting. You paint it in grayscale. It, it looks pretty good. Say hello to our Coco Connoisseur from our last video. But um, yeah, let's say you have your underpainting here and you're like, okay, I'm ready to add some color. And it doesn't have to be this rendered already. Really, the more rendered you are, the easier this is and the more you kind of see what the final will look like quickly. But I actually like to do this I would say 40 to 50% in to kind of figuring out the lighting and stuff because the sooner I introduce color, in my opinion, the more vibrant the painting becomes just because I can color pick and, you know, mixer brush or do some like nice blends and stuff. Um, getting to that part's really exciting. So let me show you real quick the three different methods that I do to kind of get an underpainting that grisaille look in here. So in Clip Studio or really any of your uh, digital art programs, you're going to have your piece right here, however many layers or whatever. You're going to make a new layer on top. And then, like I said previously, you're going to decide, okay, what do I want this to be at the final? Do I want it to be warm or do I want it to be cool? So I think here, you know, this painting's already been done, but let's say I wanted to do a redux of this and I wanted it to be in the winter time and I'm planning on like adding snow and maybe snowfall and stuff like that. So I want a lot of cool colors on here. I would say add your warm underpainting, okay? It's going to add some vibrancy. We'll show it in the next uh, little section. I'll show you an example of what it looks like and why this is a cool technique. So since this is going to be a cool painting, let's go ahead and make a warm underpainting. So on my new layer, I'm just going to get the fill bucket and then choose anything that's the yellow, the orange, the red. Um, I like to keep it mid saturation or so. And then go ahead and just fill. Now this completely covered everything up, but if you go over to your blending mode, uh, for your layer blending mode and choose color it's going to retain all of your values so it's not going to make your darks darker or your lights lighter it's not going to change the 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 uh, relationship between your darks and your lights it's just going to put the color the hue over top of your values right and the great thing about this is not only with the opacity lever can you control how much it is the intensity but if you don't like this color for whatever reason, you can always pick another one, maybe go a little bit more vibrant and then fill again. And now you can see it's not affecting the, uh, the lights and the darks. So you can come in and, oh, what's the yellow look like? Oh, that makes it look a, kind of a weird green. Um, let's do something like that. Yeah, that looks good. So you see what I mean? A lot of control here. You basically just do a color overlay. And then it puts this uh, puts this color on there. And yeah, control it with the opacity and you're good to go. You're ready to rock. Then you can just literally make a new layer and start painting with your normal colors on top of this to add some real vibrancy. So we're going to go into Rebel here and essentially do exactly the same thing. But I'm going to use a different tool to do this. Instead of just grabbing a color and going and filling, I am just going to duplicate my layer because I don't want to destroy my value layer um, or you can always make kind of a uh, adjustment layer on top of this as well. But like, okay, in here, if I go to filter, you're going to see a few different things. There's color balance, color filter, and colorize. The easiest one is colorize. 
This is very much like what we just did in Clip Studio. If you hit Colorize, you're gonna pick whatever your saturation is. So if we wanted to pick that kind of orange color, uh, the saturation's at 50%, and then you can just adjust the strength of it and start introducing that in. Do you see what I mean? Very cool, very easy, and then you can also shift it here so you can really kind of dial that in. If you wanna buck up that saturation, you can do so. But you're starting to see it does affect like some of the lights and how some of the darks and the contrast of it. It's not specifically just laying a color on it. It is doing a slight adjustment to your values. So keep that in mind, okay? So that's why I say this one's a little, it's a step up, I guess. You have a little more control. A majority of painting programs have something like a colorize. Um, let me go ahead and cancel that and actually show you what color filter looks like. Um, Photoshop has this as well, but it's called photo filter. Um, basically, you pick a color, you know, um, you can pick a color. So if we pick that same kind of warm, let's bring it up. Let's kind of bring that down there. Um, let's kind of red it up a little bit. We'll hit OK. And then the strength kind of comes up. And you can see it again. But see how it's affecting how dark the darks are and how light the lights are. So you need to watch your values while you're doing a few of these filters. So really the, the thing is, and just to kind of prove the point that you can do this, uh, do that first method to really just not even touch your values and just put a color hue over it. If you go ahead, so in here, I'll just show it again. Um, and this is in Rebel. You just click the fill button, you grab yourself a nice warm color here, do that, come down to your blending mode right here, you go to color, bam, works like a charm. Like I said, I want to say literally every single digital painting program I can think of, you can do this method, okay? So, and yeah, change that opacity right there, you're good to go, cool. Now let's head over to Photoshop. So yet again, if I just want to come over here, um, do that. I'm going to pick my, uh, pick a dark right here. Let me go ahead. Let me go to edit fill. Foreground color. Boom. Color. Same exact thing, right? However, what I want to show you here, and I actually have a whole course on this, um, is what's called gradient maps. So I saved gradient maps for last because you have way more flexibility and control, but there's a few steps on how to learn how to properly utilize these. So you can do one of two things. Either whenever you use your gradient map, and I'm coming down here to an adjustment layer, and I'm gonna click gradient map. You can kind of see <laughs> that it's doing some trippy stuff. Um, so before we get into what a gradient map is, um, at any point, if you want to change this blending mode to color, it does the same thing yet again. Do you know what I mean? Like now I can come and pick any of these cool gradients that I might have. And it's giving at a very quick glance, you know, it's not a, it's not hitting any of the values because it's just washing the hue over the values we already have. But if we change this to a normal blending mode, you can see it washed out some of this. And if we come through and just start selecting these, see how the blacks are pitch black, but then everything else kind of fades away. Here, let me uh, move this a little bit. Um, I'll move that here, move this here. So depending on which one I pick, you know, that one's a nice gray with some blues and the highlights. You can see the map down here. This really cool one right here. So more kind of a, oh, the smaller granular controls. And what you're looking at down here is basically where on the value spectrum a certain color will appear. So for instance, way down here is going to be all black. Way up here is going to be all white. And then as you go through the lightness, so if we click right here, this is what happens at 75% lightness. So a 7.5 out of 10 on the value scale, with 10 being white, 
and one or zero being black, right? So this is 75% right here. You should be about 50%. Yep. And then right here, about 25%. Yep. So you can introduce more colors. Um, so on your gradient map, and this works on a majority of gradient map tools. Um, Photoshop's just the one I'm the most used to. But if you come over here, and let's say I want to add a darker, richer blue here. I'm going to click and see how it has the color selected. And now it kind of did some goofy stuff with my darks. It's because the color I picked does not match the value that it's representing. Does that make sense? So uh, I, I am making Simplifying Color Theory Part 2, and we're going to talk a lot about chroma. Chroma is where a color lives, realistically. Like, So here, this doesn't really match, right? Because if I move this around and you can see the, the darks, it's replacing those darks. It's not doing very well. So the location here is at 13%, OK? Now, if I click on color and notice where my um, hue, saturation, and brightness, the brightness for this is at 48%, but the location is at 13%. So what would happen if I get this brightness, because this is what a value spectrum is, and change this to 13%? Okay, that looks way better. Um, it's still kind of weird, right? Um, and you can even change the amount of saturation at 100%. Okay. And yeah, it's, it's weird, but it fits better. Okay. Um, you can even like slightly modify some of that. Um, mess with it a little bit. You know what I mean? Like... You have a lot of granularity here. So if you really want to get crazy, if we just cancel that one, um, we can come over here and I think the delete key works. Yes, delete key works. Um, let's say we want to add a nice bright blue right here. <laughs> so the color that we had selected is now here at 61. So if we change this, come to brightness and 61. It fits better. You know what I mean? It still looks weird, but it does fit better. So you can play with kind of those colors right there. Let's let's do something real crazy. Yeah, get like a purple or a, you know. Lower that saturation a little bit, but keep it around the, where was that? A 61 down here. Then we'll put 61 here. Boom. So it fits, it works. Technically it is correct. Um, optically it works. So like I said, gradient maps are a little more finicky. They're also um, give you a lot more customization. The reason why I wouldn't recommend this as the go-to for putting an underpainting is you can get really caught up in the minutia of trying to get these values right and this good and does that look right and you're going to spend so much time on the underpainting that you're going to end up kind of solving problems that you're not ready to solve yet as far as like later in the painting so you're going to get your gradient map looking great and then you're not going to want to paint over it which you know i ain't your mama so do what you want but you know, this whole thing is to be the underpainting, a base that you paint on top of. So I hope that was clear. Like I said, I do have a whole course kind of going over gradient maps. It also comes with like 30 or 40 gradient maps that you can use. Um, and it works on the newer versions of Photoshop and stuff like that. Anything that takes the gradient, um, the, uh, the gradient files from Adobe, uh, it should work. But, uh, but yeah, come back to color right here. So yeah, very, very easy stuff. Like I said, it can be super easy. It can be um, as kind of complex as you want it to be. I would say just keep this part simple. Put down a color. Don't worry about it. Just make sure it's kind of the reverse 
of what your painting is going to be. So if it's going to be a warm painting, make sure that your underpainting is cool. But if it is a cool painting, make sure that underpainting is warm. So now let's kick over. Um, I'm going to get into Rebel, and we're actually going to take a look at why this works and why this is a really cool thing to do because it's gonna give you a lot of vibrancy and I wanna show you an example of that. So yeah, let's let's head back over to Rebel and take a look. All right, so we are in Rebel here and yeah, we got our Coco Connoisseur right here. We have the uh, color overlay right here on top of this black and white. So I'm actually gonna merge this down. Um, let me select the, oh, this one and this one right click merge layers cool so now we have our kind of black and white version just in case and then we also have um, our kind of color tinted one right here so let me duplicate this and i want to show you why this is such a cool technique so like i said we want to end up with this being a very cool painting right um, as far as like cold temperature so what we can do is whenever we select a color, if we look over at the color wheel and choose the opposite, the complement of it, um, in color theory, you know, complement doesn't mean it goes well together. Complement means it completes the spectrum of light. Um, this goes into some crazy color theory stuff, but basically adding the color that's across from the color wheel and the same intensity, the same kind of vibration, the same amount of vibrance, um, you get a really nice painterly traditional look to it because the way our eye will process it is actually pretty interesting. So perfect example. Let me go ahead and let me um, maybe start coloring or painting this uh, uh, the the scarf here. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to pick over here, and what I might do is even lower. Well, let me do this first, just so I can show you guys. It's the same value. It's the same saturation. All this stuff, just the difference, the complement on the color wheel. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to grab kind of my paint and mix brush. Let me lower that down considerably. And start painting. Um, do the same thing here. Kind of grab that. Something here. Let me grab the kind of highlight. Come over there. And I'm also going to grab the actual warm color as well. Come back over, use the complement. Then I don't even really need to use the complement. I can do something like this. I can still go in the cool side. And then let's say I want to up the vibrancy, um, the saturation, and then uh, kind of lower the value a little bit and start painting within here. What's going to end up happening is let me get this one. Let me bring these down here. And I'm going to get that dark, that light right here. Now, it doesn't seem like much yet, but I promise you it will. Once you start adding more and more of these complements in here, this whole thing is really going to start to pop. If we do that, let me up the saturation, but really up that value a little bit. Get some of these. The reason why this works and the reason why this technique is actually pretty interesting to use is if you zoom in, especially on a program like Rebel or Art Rage or Procreate with certain brushes, see how you can see these little bits of warm peering through the 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 cool the underpainting and see that kind of vibrancy that you have here and this is all accidental almost like this is this is something that 
it really adds some dimensionality to the painting. It makes it feel more traditional. It makes it look more traditional. And in my opinion, it's more fun to paint this way because you're constantly getting variations. Nothing's looking fully digital. Nothing's looking flat. Nothing's looking um, synthetic. You know what I mean? Even though these are synthetic brushes, you know, these, this darker warm almost looks like a purple red compared to the turquoise green and the, this blue doesn't exist anywhere else, maybe over here. But like you're getting repeat colors without even trying. And it's because the optics of your eye are blending. And really you can even do it like, okay, let's say I want, um, let's say I want the fur to be red. Let's say, you know, I want the rest of this stuff to be cool, but I want the fur to actually be red. You can still do that. You can come over here. You can take this. And once again, if you come over here and you just maybe add a little bit, but maybe lower that saturation, make it kind of blend a little bit more with, uh, you know, what we have here. And then maybe red more. Bam, bam you're still getting little bits of that darker brown or, or that kind of wash, that grisaille underpainting through these colors. So the colors themselves look more vibrant. It's, it's a really interesting thing. And um, yeah, I'm working on a few pieces right now that are using this technique and I'm really happy with how they're turning out. Um, I can't show them because they are for clients, but um, <laughs> but like I'm really digging um, this look. It's kind of the new way I work now. Uh, and what's nice is it also gives you new colors you can just pick from instead of going to the color wheel all the time and trying to do, you know, this or that. Um, you can actually come here and let's say that the flat oily round. Let's see, we want to carve out a little bit. You can grab some of these and start kind of blending in these really nice colors and you can even integrate the warms into the painting like you don't have to paint over every single pixel you can keep a lot of this because you're going to have that nice color vibration because of the temperature changes you know what i mean um just really fun really interesting way to work and yeah, I can't recommend it enough, really. I mean, it's just, it works so well <laughs> that like it's my new go-to and, and yeah, it's just a lot of fun. Um, and then you can just come and kind of play around. It kind of frees you up to paint in a way that's maybe a little bit more spontaneous than the way you might normally work. And see, even with these nice smear brushes or a mixer brush or something like that, you can get a lot of really fun, vibrant um, kind of looks uh, with some of these things. So if I come over here, maybe do that, maybe keep it real light and hit some of the bright lights right there. Have some of those. See, and this is what I mean. I could I could literally just paint like this for hours because everything you're adding is going to just add more complexity, more interest to your um, to the piece. I mean, it just really is. And you still get bits, even after all that kind of brushwork, and you'll still get like smears of that underpainting. Do you see what I mean? It's just really cool, really, really cool way to do it. So I advise you, try this out. See if this works for you. Um, I hope it does. I hope it maybe even has a kind of a spark on, makes you more comfortable with layers or, you know, just kind of going off the beaten path with your techniques. But yeah, uh, it's been fun. Thanks so much. I can't wait to show you some of the stuff I'm working on because it is using this and I'm getting some incredibly realistic looking effects. Like it looks like I painted this and, uh, you know, on... Uh, canvas with my oils and you know just doctored it up on digital but no nope, it's all digital man um, I can't wait to show you guys so yeah um, if you haven't already please subscribe uh, like you know share it with people we'd love to have you 
And uh, until next time, take care and go make cool art.